So we're going to start chapter 22. We're not going to do the whole chapter 22. We're just going to look at the plant-like protists since we're going to be following the evolution of plants. We talked about the evolution of animals uh, prior to this, and now we're going to look into the kingdom plantae. Now, I really did like this picture, but I didn't transfer into this program very well. But you should have it on your PowerPoint, and it's also on Canvas. And what they're showing you is how the kingdom, Protista, has been divided up into different groups. Now, on your lab station, you'll see where I have divided those up for you and introduced you to how they have broken the domain, Eukarya, up into subgroups. Now, I'm not going to ask you what those subgroups are, but I just want you to get an idea of how they were separated. And you can see where the other uh, kingdoms that fall within Eukarya kind of shake out with the fungi, the plants, and the animals. So let's start with our first phylum, Chlorophyta. This is where we're going to find our green algae. Land plants are thought to evolve from this group, so land plants closest uh, ancestor would be in phylum Chlorophyta. There are basic three basic types of chlorophytes. So we'll just talk about the first group in Chlorophyta, and that is the single cell organisms. And the example that I'm going to use is Clamdomonas. So Clamdomonas is um, a single cell organism, and you can see by the green color that it undergoes um, photosynthesis. So it's an autotroph. We can see here. I have a picture of this prenoid, which is a cup-shaped organelle that carries out photosynthesis. We also have an eye spot, and that eye spot, and you see it up here, the red dot, is used to help detect light. So if you were in a large body of water, it would be a very good idea, and it would make you more successful. I can't just say it's an idea, but individuals that are able to detect light would then be more successful than those that did not have that capability to detect light. All right, when we talk about reproduction, this is, gets very complicated with plants, so we're going to start with some basic stuff here. And let's start, first of all, with asexual reproduction. So you have the individual. They're going to undergo basically mitosis and produce these offspring here, which are haploids, zoospores. So we start with haploid, we end up with haploid. Again, it's just mitosis, um, and then we end up with identical offspring. Now, and the other possible mechanism of reproduction then here is, again, we undergo this um, mitosis, but... When we um, we do this, we find that we have two different strains. We have a positive and negative. We try not to say male and female because that refers to different gametangia or male and female parts. We don't really notice that. We just notice that there is one that's positive one that's negative. Now, those individuals in the offspring there, the gametes you could say, will get together and fuse. And when they fuse, that term we're going to use is called syngamy. Now, syngamy is that fusion of those individuals. So if you have one in, plus one in, we now have a zygote that has two in. It's diploid. Now, once we have our zygote here, we're going to undergo meiosis. And as you know, meiosis results. And when you undergo meiosis, you're going to get some genetic variation. So the offspring are not identical. They're a combination of those two different strains. And so now we have our mature, we're back to haploid cells that can then either go through sexual or asexual reproduction again. Now, another type of chlorophyte would be individuals that form colonies. Now, colonies are cells that can fully function independently, but they find if they stick together, they can kind of mediate certain tasks, movement, reproduction, and they can um, be much more successful working together and cooperating for um, the basic goal of reprodu reproducing and passing on their genetic information to be successful. Now here's some other colony um, type of chlorophytes. When we look at these, this here is actually an individual cell. 
and you can't quite tell. Um, you can tell probably more over here. Um, this is gliocapsa on this side. Now gliocapsa, we can see the cells are sticking together. This clear stuff here, the clear goop, that's a mucus, and that mucus is what's holding those four cells together into a colony. Now here, the goop or the mucus is right here, so as these individuals reproduce, they put kind of like that glue here, and they stick on that sister or daughter, we can call it the daughter cell, then is right attached to it. So that's how we can form some other types of colonies. So when we look at the multicellular chlorophytes, we're going to look at a specimen called ulva, or also referred to commonly as sea lettuce. And when you look at sea lettuce, there's a picture in your book, and there's also a picture at the station. You can see where it looks like lettuce. Now the body is referred to as a thallus, and the thallus is a the the leaves are like two cell thick. And we're also going to get into this alternation of generations, which is how they reproduce. And here is a picture of what sea lettuce looks like. All right, so when we talk about the life cycle of sea lettuce, let's just start here with the mature sporophyte. So sporophyte is 2N. You are going to need to understand what's the sporophyte and the gametophyte as we move through plant evolution. So in this particular case, the sporophyte... Ooh. The sporophyte is diploid. Now, in order to make your um, gametes, right, you're going to undergo meiosis, which means you're going to go from 2N to 1N, and that's going to be formed in this structure called the sporangia. The sporangia are going to release the zoospores, which are 1N, they're haploid. The zoospores are then going to grow into an adult gametophyte. In this case, that is 1N. So notice we've now gone from a mature, you, you really could not tell the difference between this guy over here and this guy over here, other than this one is diploid and this one's haploid. So we've gone from diploid to haploid, then we're going to go back to diploid, which is where we get that alternation of generations. So if this was mom and mom is, is diploid, notice that this would be the child, or let's just say the daughter, and the daughter then would be haploid, and then the grandchildren would be back to diploid. So every other generation, haploid, diploid, haploid, diploid. So here we have the gametophyte, which is 1N, and then the, the, the gametangia here is going to make gametes that are 1N, and they're going to fuse together with that term syngamy again. And as we undergo well, basically fertilization, but we're fusing two individuals here uh, into the zygote, the zygote then will grow by mitosis and form the mature sporophyte. And here is another picture of a multicellular organism in the phylum Chlorophyta called stoneworts. And if we actually look at these structures here, they are made up of like a calcium carbonate substance that is kind of makes it the stone. And since they look like little bumps coming out, that's where they get the word warts. So this is stoneworts or cara. So some other phyla that we're going to look at, we're going to look at Rhodophyta, Phaophyta, Chrysophyta, and Euglena. So let's start with Rhodophyta. Now Rhode, you can kind of look at that, means red algae. Now red algae use pigments that allow them to grow deeper in the water column. So when we look at red algae, because of the depth in which we find them, they usually appear almost black. Now this type of uh, this type of algae is used to make many prod products. One of which is agar. Um, it's found in gelatin, jelly, desserts, chocolates, capsules. You know the actual capsule coating that the medicines contained in. And then we have toothpaste and cosmetics. So we use red algae for a lot of different products. And then here are some samples or specimens of different types of red algae. Now the other phylum we're going to look at is phylum Phaophyta, and this is the brown algae. Now brown algae is different in that 
Their carbohydrate storage is not in the form of starch, but in a molecule called laminarin. So it is very, it's different than, than a car, uh, different type of complex carbohydrate. So when we look at plant evolution, that's one of the things we do look at is how do those plant-like protists store their excess sugar? What type of macromolecule? Another thing that we tend to look at is what types of chlorophyll pigments do they have? And phaophyto is found to have chlorophyll A and C, plus some carotenoid, which is, remember, an accessory pigment that gives them their brown color. Well, this really sucks. <laughs> so again, certain pictures are not transferring into this program, but you can see here some of the big, large brown uh, kelps that we see here. And you do need to know some of the basic anatomy and the leaves on these large kelps are called blades. And then you'll have these little bubbles down here called gas bladders. And those gas bladders actually help to suspend the kelp up at the surface in order for them to, to uh, photosynthesize. They also are going to have a little thing down here called a hold fast, which actually anchors them to the ground. Um, do be sure you look at this and you're supposed to draw something like this at that lab station. Now if you go online on Canvas or even in your handout, you'll see that I have a few samples of um, brown algae there that, again, didn't transfer in. So there should have been pictures here of different types of brown algae. So the next phylum would be Chrysophyta, and there are many different individuals in this particular phyla. <clears throat> Phytoplankton consists of a large number of chrysophytes. Phyto, again, meaning photo. So um, when we look at those words, notice that we have that word in almost all of these plant-like organisms, that phyta. So these um, include, the phytoplankton include diatoms, um, dinoflagellates, and several other phyla. So when we talk about phyla, phytoplankton, we're actually talking about several different groups, um, or should we say phyla. So the first group, let's talk about diatoms, and these are actually made up of two cell walls that are made up of silica or glass. Those well, two cell walls, they're, they're referred to as valves, and they kind of sit together like these petri dishes. So you have one piece that will kind of snap together with the other. Here's a picture of some of the different individuals that um, are found in this particular group of diatoms. We use diatomaceous earth, which is basically diatoms that have all been dead and fall to the bottom of the ocean. And that diatomaceous earth will um, allow for it to be used for filtering or for an abrasive product because of that glass that's inside these um, valves here can be very abrasive. The next phylum would be pyrophyta, and this group is also um, has many individuals, but they're referred to dinoflagellates. They also have silica plates, and they have two flagella, where we did not see the flagella on diatoms. Some of these can form symbiotic relationship with coral, and some of these individuals are parasitic. An example of a parasitic um, Pyrophyta would be the one responsible for what is called red tide. So this is not like some big, huge red paint spill. These are all um, those individual um, dinoflagellates that it's kind of like a bloom, an al algal bloom here of these individuals that contain a red pigment. And we'll talk about how significant that is in, in a second. Now what happens when there's these large algal bloom, it gets into the food chain. And this particular individual, Gymnodinium brevis, um, is the dinoflagellate that's responsible for large amounts of um, death here with fish and sh shellfish and all kinds of different organisms. And these individual um, dinoflagellates actually have a neurotoxin which kills large number of organisms. We've kind of talked about biological magnification, so it kind of goes through the food web and and then eventually it, it kills these uh, poor organisms that have been feeding off of the uh, phytoplankton that carries this toxin. And one of the last groups I'm going to talk about is called the phylum Euglenophyta. Ooh, missing a T here. Phyta. 
Um, they have very similar characteristics to Clamdemonas. This is um, that they're single cellular. They have that eye spot to detect light, and they also have a prenoid. Now, if you can look at these individuals, they're actually going to split like right down the center by binary fidget. So you can see how we start off with one and we split into two. Now, you, there's a problem with euglena because euglena, about a third of them photosynthesize and two-thirds of them are heterotrophic. So it's kind of a really problem for taxonomists because they have both plant-like and animal-like methods of obtaining energy. So where do you put it? They also reproduce by binary fission, which we see in bacterial cells. So this is really kind of um, a, a jack-of-all-trades organism. And here we just have a different way of organizing our plant-like protist. And we can see over um, on this side we have our chlorophytes and the different organisms within that group. And then we have, of course, our land plants right here. And then we have some of the other, um, you could say, um, multicellular or colonial um, algae 